something for this uh, one uh, introduction. I would like to thank uh, you all, uh, the one host I feel always I'm visiting this observatory, especially because of Anna, Adriano, Santi, and of course, Professor Ray. So, I'm going to try in this talk to show you the concept of the terraformation history, how to compute a star formation history, with code we have developed to do that, uh, the results for having uh, deriving the, the star formation history from the local group uh, drop taxes, and the, the project project we are involved right now uh, for the future, for the, in, in the future. So, before defining what is a star formation history, we have to, to introduce uh, a very more simple concept, which is the star formation. So it was Bard in 1944 who discovered, using two photographic plates, or in, in, uh, of the galaxy I-616-13, two different types of stars. One, observing the blue plate concentrated toward the center, and another, observing the red plate uh, of the East galaxy, more extended towards the center one. So he called the more concentrated one, population one, and population two, the more extended, right? So, stellar population definition started with difference in color. And also distribution, different distribution, rather than distribution in a galaxy. So later on, the more characteristics were added to this definition. For example, <coughs> population one, we becomes younger ages and less mortal poor star, and population two, we realize that were older ages and more metal poor stars. With time, more characteristics have been added to this definition. For example, dynamics, dust content of the interstellar medium uh, surrounding this type of, of, of a star. For example, in the Milky Way, we see that the uh, population one are in the circle, the, the orbit, the circular, while in population two are radial, the orbits. And also, the uh, star population are found mostly in one or other type of galaxy. For example, population one are found mostly in spiral and regular galaxy, while population two is more located, are mostly routinely found in elliptical or trap spheroidal galaxy. So, with this in mind, we define a star formation history as the distribution of a star form in a stellar system as a function of age and metallicity. We can add more characteristics to the definition, but we are going to stick strictly to these two variables, R, age and metallicity. Uh, so the a star formation history is the study of how the stellar population of a system evolved with that. A very nice uh, representation of a star formation history is the population one. It was introduced by Paul Hodge in 1988 and it represents the frequency of forming a of form star, the number of star formed as a function of time and metallicity. So this is a representation of a system composed only by population two stars. This is all a metal pool. And this is a, a concept of a representation of a star formation history of the Milky Way, which uh, uh, evolution in metallicity and a start of old ages and increasing star formation. But this is a draw by hand, it's only a concept. It's based on intuition only. So 10 years uh, later, Eva Grell showed for the first time a star formation history based in main features you know, on the coral matter diagram. In this case, it's for Phoenix drop galaxy. So, by observing the presence of an RGB star, carbon star, H2 regions, main sequence cephate, she could also trace what is the, uh, the concept, the, the, the qualitative star formation.
information the history of this galaxy. So this is a representation of all the intermediate and the upstream. This uh, is a qualitative representation of the star formation history, no numbers on that. So we have to wait 20 years from here to here to have a quantitative star formation history of a galaxy. This is uh, made by counting stars in a color magnitude diagram. And as you see, we can make more detailed signs with a quantitative star formation history than with a qualitative star formation history. This represents the same galaxy separated by 10 years. So let's focus on the representation of this type of 3D representation of the star formation history with, because it, uh, it has a, a lot of information. First, what we have here is age <coughs> and metallicity in this exit. This is old, this is young, this is metal rich, and this is metal blue. And what we have here is the, the mass of the stars formed form as a function of age and metallicity. If we project this, which is the star formation history, alongside the metallicity axis, what we obtain is the usual star formation rate as a function of time. And if we project this alongside the age axis, what we obtain is the metallicity distribution of all the stars ever formed in a galaxy. But more, even more, the projection of the star formation history over the age metallicity plane gives the age metallicity relation. That's it, the metallicity as a function of time for the star form in the gas. So the technique to obtain the star formation history differs significantly if we use resolved or unresolved stellar system. For resolved stellar system, we use stellar population 15 using normative diagrams. Meanwhile, for unresolved stellar system, we use star population synthesis using galaxy star. So the difference is uh, uh, quite enough uh, to have a different, uh, a more precise result or not. And some of them uh, have some some advantage or disadvantage. For example, for if we have resolved star population, we can obtain the star formation history, but can we use only local galaxy? because we need to resolve the stars. That's implied use a deep core metric diagram and larger observing time than compared with the resolved star system. We know no need for the, the estimation of the spectra energy distribution for absolute and absolute star formation history and is very good in age resolution if the observations are uh, good enough. But uh, for resolve can, uh, population can be used as spectra, can be used to obtain the star formation history at larger distance than the result one. It requires shorter observing times, and, but needs an estimation of the spectra energy distribution form an absolute star formation history. And the age resolution is less precise than in this case. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the result of the star population, so our object of uh, observation is the color magnitude diagram. So why can we use a color magnitude diagram to obtain a star formation history? This is because stellar evolution models show how stars distribute in a color magnitude diagram as a function of age and metallicity, which are the main uh, variables in the definition of the stellar population. So what, what I'm showing here is the distribution of uh, a stellar population in a chromatic diagram using Basti Stellar Population Library. So here is the age of the stellar population, this column, and this is the, the, the width of the, of the time formation of each stellar population. So of this column we have a population 12.7 here, mass, uh, plus uh, uh, minus 0.5. All for the same metallicity. And what we see is that we, if we are able to reach the oldest main sequence turnoff, the turnoff of the star population, we 
can distinguish <coughs> this region, the stellar population among, between them. I mean, we need to reach the old main sequence, that's the two known, to separate the age of the star population. All the features like the, the RGB for a fixed metallicity show a dispersion in age. But this is again for a set for the same metallicity for all the star population. What if there is an evolution in the metallicity? As <coughs> usually in stellar uh, systems with uh, uh, extended star formation, metals evolve with time. And what we have with is this. So now we have older star with low uh, uh, metal pool and younger star with uh, less metal pool. And everything is more complicated. For example, now the RGB, all the star population are almost in the same place. Right, so we cannot use the, the RGB anymore to, to trace the, the age of the stellar population. Right? But this is even more complicated because these are what the stellar evolution library predicts in the distribution of the chromatic diagram. But when we go to our telescope and take our observation, there are some time things. Um, Might need to have error. And everything is messed up. And all yeah, this is the second panel, there is no uh, scatter in age. Or there is yeah, it's the same, the same scatter. The same so so there is a scatter in age. The only difference is okay. the metallicity. Okay. 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 So what we have is a more scatter in the distribution of the stellar population in a chronology diagram. So it's more complicated. But we can still do something with this. So what we need to obtain a star formation history from a, a chronology diagram even with uh, 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 this observational effect. Okay. So what we need first is a deep color magnitude diagram reaching the oldest main sequence to now to separate the different this between the, the, the stellar population, the age, the other stellar population, and the metallicity. Second, a stellar evolution library to compare our observation with a model. And a method to obtain by comparison of, the, of both the distribution of the stellar population as a function of age and metallicity. So we have developed a method to do that. Let's start with a uh, star formation history that again we define as the mass of the star formed in a stellar system as a function of age and metallicity. This is our star formation history. And we assume that any star formation history can be represented as a linear combination of simple stellar population. This is a star formation history composed by simple star population. It's a simple star population is one of this block. A simple star population is a number of stars within a small range of age and metallicity. So by rising and lowering all these simple uh, stellar population, we can take, uh, have a star formation history like this, which represents what if we, is, we try to find. So what we have to do is try to find this weight of each simple stellar population. So how we find this weight? We know that different stellar we know that different star, simple star population distributes in different way in a chromatic diagram. For example, this old metal pool star, simple star population distributes alongside this here in the uh, chromatic diagram, this uh, standard RGB, and this young simple star population distributes in a different way, the blue one, in a chromatic diagram. So what we have to do is to compare the distribution of the Synthetic, all the synthetic uh, simple star population with the distribution of the observed uh, 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 star in a chromatic diagram. So we count, we divide sample of the chromatic diagram in boxes and count and compare the number of stars in each box, box with the distribution of the simple star population in the same box. So with a metric function, we can minimize try to find the weight, so try to re uh, reproduce a synthetic 
neutral magnitude diagram, which we sound, which is more, uh, uh, it's the, the best representation of the surface bond. And with these uh, uh, weights in, the, in this uh, linear combination, we can obtain the star formation. This is the method, a very beautiful explain it, of our uh, of our technique to obtain the, the star formation. So we have developed a set of code to obtain this, uh, but uh, using IS star to reproduce the model, IS uh, pop and minia to uh, come for star, make the sample, and average all the solution, and so on. So with this in mind, with te this technique, we can go now to uh, uh, resolve star formation history in our uh, local group. And why the local group? Because mostly for two reasons. First, it contains galaxies of different types for, for uh, different times. Five degree degree morphological types. Five degree uh, include the dark spheroidal, the two uh, dark spheroidal we have developed group, are near enough to resolve the old main sequence to know, for example. We, we can resolve the old main sequence to know all, for all galaxies in this circle using rich enable for certain time. Uh, this is our representation of the local group. Contain the three in the in this plane. Contain the three uh, uh, spiral galaxies of the local group. It's a Milky Way, M33 and M31. One here. The color code denotes different types of morphological type of galaxy, and the, the center is the bar center of the local. So as we see, we have a, a, a very interesting number of different morphological types. So, uh, of this galaxy, so we can uh, use them to obtain star formation history for a large number of morphological types and galaxies in the local. So, uh, the local group contains spiral galaxy, trap elliptical galaxy, irregular galaxy, and spherical galaxy. As you see, the most, most of them are trough. So, just like before, uh, just a question. Usually in the library of stellar planets, you have also. Sorry? You have also the helium abundance. Yeah, and yeah. How do you fix it for each so we, we, that you have to simulate or you have to, to do all that in the synthetic chrome magnetic diagram. Okay. If that's affected to the synthetic chrome diagram in the position of the star, then you can recover. You can take account of that. You can, uh, uh, I mean, that will be reflected in your solution. It does, if, if including on helium abundance in your model uh, doesn't affect your deposition of the star, then you are not going to see any of this uh, effect. But you simulate in the synthetic chrome diagram. You have yes. to do that. Yes, yeah. but my question is, uh, can in principle, uh, helium in principle can affect the position of the star in a synthetic That depends. Uh, well, Santika maybe it can answer it better, but that depends on the, of the, of the type of of the metallicity and the uh, abundance of the, of the galaxy. Yeah. They, they adopt the one that is embedded in the stellar model library that you are adopting. So you use the standard helium enrichment ratio that is included so, in the library. Uh, this was it's the not an additional free parameter. The normal one, no. yes. No. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, uh, so just a question. Yeah. Uh, did you try to, uh, to understand if uh, changing this relation, the helium enrichment law, ever no, for this galaxy, not for this galaxy. But now we are working in a new stellar evolution library, and we 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 would like to, to test that this chain, introducing a new abundance chain, affect or not. But I would like to add also that you are, you are right that you is an additional two parameter, but take into account that the metallicity range that is spanned in this galaxy is not so large. So if you modify the new enrichment ratio in the we say within the, the expected error bar, you don't uh, expect uh, that your solution change a lot. They are not extremely metal rich uh, star in this galaxy. Surely, we know that now that in globular cluster there are also extremely <coughs> rich uh, stars, but this should be not the case for both galaxies. Mm -hmm. for different so, in general, different. No. 
So the metallicity range is uh, from 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 3, let me say. Yeah, so like if that. you modify the minimum enrichment ratio from 1 to 3, the change in the corresponding minimum abundance is not so large to modify significantly the evolution of time and so position. In case you are going in the direction of estimating the effects of different uh, inputs uh, on the... Yeah, the yeah, the NAO.
So what we see is that the two transferoidal, C2 and Tukaga, are very similar. The main bulk of the star formation is old, and we were quench, oh, both of them were quenching HD, around 8 years old, uh, ago. Sorry. And what we see here, this we detect here, is a, a stellar population, um, metal pool, and around 4 5 years old. And what is this? If we look back and see the the column diagram, what we detect there is blue stratus. And in a column diagram, this, this star are resolved at, uh, in the star formation history with low metallicity, occupy the region of low metallicity star and an intermediate age of four, five, uh, between <coughs> four and two gigahertz. So we have detected this, the blue circle here. The um, star formation history of the, uh, of the of these two galaxies, the transition galaxy, are very similar to the transferoidal galaxy in the main book. As you see, there is a very, very old main book. And after that, there is a low star formation rate. That is the main difference with the spherical one. And the two irregulars show ICCT 13 almost a flat, uh, a constant star formation rate. And in the case of Leo A, it's very particular because it shows a very low star formation rate before 10 years uh, ago. But uh, almost the peak. Even the peak of the star formation is only 5 GB years old in this case. This is a galaxy with a lot of gas. So let's put all the star formation histories together, like in here. This is uh, uh, the star formation history as a function of time, this is young, and the uh, uh, age metallicity relation. The metallicity as a function of time. So what we see, the, we have uh, plotted here a shaded region that show the reionization epoch. So what we see is that the reionization seems to have not stopped the star formation in any of the galaxies. So because the star formation is after, clearly after the epoch of reionization. It's not a clear quenching in some way. Actually, some of them, Phoenix, Leroy, and ICC 1613, have a medium to have the star formation rate clearly located after the epoch of reionization. So it seems that the, um, and the uh, on the first uh, look, at the, uh, at the first look, it seems that the reinsertion have not affected these guys. But if you remember the the picture of IC 1630, there is a clear difference in the distribution of the star population: younger toward the center, older, extender, uh, more than the younger. What what if the reinsertion have affected? has affected differently to, the, to, to different regions of the galaxy. Has, for example, not affected to the center, but affected to the outskirts of the galaxy. So to look that for that, we divide the galaxy in two separate regions. The center one, which is uh, represented for these four galaxies. We select only four galaxies because it has a better spatial coverage to analyze the radial gradients. So these are the chromatic diagrams for the uh, central part and an older part separate more than two scale length of the central one. <coughs> and what we see is that in the case of C2 Tukana, there is no, <coughs> in principle, there are not so, at first glance, there's not so much different in the chromatic diagram. But if we look at the, those guys with more gas, edges 3, or more recent stellar formation, like edges 3 and Phoenix, what we see is a clear difference between the uh, upper mean sequence that disappear when you go out, outside the galaxy to the outskirts of the galaxy. So if we have obtained the star formation history uh, with the assumption radio for this galaxy to see if there is uh, any effect of the radiation on this galaxy. We are not going to use this because the low number of statistics in this galaxy which was observed with the white P2, not with the ATS, we, uh, we don't reach it uh, with good precision uh, the, the main sequence, all main sequence for now. So we are not going to use that. But the rest. So these are the star formation histories as a function of radius. This is the center for the four galaxies, and this is the Oscar. And we, I have plotted also a grid band here showing 
where is the, where the place of the reunification, where is the locator. So what we see is that at first glance, it seems that even in the, in the outskirts of the galaxy, the star, the, the, they still form a star. After the of reunification, as you can see here, extend the star formation, extend after theory, after the epoch of the reunification. So the universe was fully reunited here, and what's expected that for this type of galaxy with uh, uh, velocity dispersion below 20 kilometers per second, model predict that this galaxy should have stopped the star formation in the epoch of reunification. No star formation after the epoch of realization at Richard Six. So what's going on here? So what is wrong? Are the models wrong, probably, or are the observations wrong? So it, what what is going on here? So we have something more to, to investigate. You you see that when, when in the chromatic two diagram, observational effect uh, spread. The, the stellar population in a chromatic diagram, so everything is messed up. What if observational effects affect to the measurement of the width of the uh, stellar formation? This is a star formation history of LG3. So, how much short is the star formation time? So, this is the star formation uh, rate as a function of time, and this is the mass metallicity. So, we can measure the star formation uh, uh, time, the, the formation time, for example, using the, the width of the Gaussian. We can fit the Gaussian here and measure the width, right? So, how sh much short is this if we could take out the observational effect? How observational effect affects to the widening of this picture? So, what we can do is edge resolution test. We, we, do, we do this. So we take a very narrow synthetic stellar population of a few million years. We simulate in this synthetic mock stellar population the observational effects and try to recover again, again with the same method that we use for the real one, the star formation. And what happened? Well, what happened is that a very narrow star formation uh, burst of few million years is recovered as a Gaussian of half G a year. And this effect is worse when you move to older ages. So if we introduce, if we try to recall a very narrow star formation, uh, very old star formation, around 13 G years, for example here, we recover with 1.13 and uh, with a year year width. That is the effect of the of a, of a, of observational effects and the older recovering process of the star formation. But also see that the the peak of the of the recovery star formation history is shifted to younger ages. Excuse me, Sebastian. What do you mean for observational effect? Photometric error. Photometric error. Not only blend, photometric okay. error, blending, um, uh, uh, also the, the noise, in with, uh, uh, the, the, the missing stars, all of it. But also, this include the, 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 the measuring process of the star formation history. So you have your errors in the comment diagram, but you have also to obtain the star formation history, which introduces a, a, a an error, an additional error in the estimation of the age. So the observational effect also shift the peak of the star formation uh, to younger ages in at all ages. So I understand that the, the width, the broadening of the Gaussian increase mm -hmm. when you increase the age because the photometric error are larger being a finer star. What is the reason for the shift in the location of the peak? The shift, uh, that I think that uh, is uh, that's, uh, is affected both for part of the observational effects because uh, the, this, the, the, the spread of the population is not Gaussian always. So probably it's, it's a, a, have some kurtosis, some skewness, 
and this displaces to a younger age or younger age. For example, we know that uh, when we make a completeness test, failed star test, we know that uh, stars uh, are recovered brighter than what we introduce. We introduce a magnitude, a star of, with a certain magnitude, and for certain, certain for the st uh, stars that are uh, uh, dimmer, we recover the brighter. That is an effect. So pro is all related with that. So it's not a, a Gaussian dispersion at all. Observational effects, 
and we recover star formation history, what we obtain, our final Gaussian, is an impulse response function. And so we can use this impulse uh, response function to decompose the observational effects from the original signal. And we do it this way. So, we take our impulse response function and a set of input non convoked star formation history. And these are free from observational effects. And we convoke this with our input response function to obtain the convoked star formation history. That's it. This with observational effects. And we compare the blue one with the orange one, which is the observer one. So those input non convolved star formation history that after convolution with this full response better match the observation are assumed as the best representation of the original star formation history without observational effects. And what happens when we see this star formation history without observational effect? What we see is that everything is shifted toward all the radius. And the formation time is shorter, much shorter than what, what, than what I, we are measuring. So, what can we do now with this information? So, we can compare it now with the model. We can, because in some way we have subtracted the observational effects from the result of the challenge. And what we see is that the a bovine agricultural predicts that two fossils from the pre realization era have the 70% of the, uh, the stellar mass formed at the epoch of realization, 12.7 years ago. So here is the cumulative star formation history. What we have is done, and this is the, the percent of the uh, mass formed at some epoch. And the um, clear uh, gray shows the observations. The, the, the star formation history without uh, any uh, any correction and the dark gray show the corrected star formation history by the convolution and the shadow. So looking at the uh, observational ones without correction, we see that barely neither of these galaxies fulfill the criteria of true full, full, uh, true fossil record set by popular recording. But for the uh, unshifted star formation history, we see that some of them are within the requirements of true fossil record of radiation. So in general, the age of the 70 percentile of the mass is shifted to our older ages, 1.25 giga years, which represent 40 percent of the age of the universe at that time. So. Finally, and that is more evident in the outskirts of the galaxy, which would be uh, uh, affected, have been affected more by radiation than the inner region. Sorry, another curiosity on the previous slides. When you adopt the convolvent transformation history, you get a very good reproduction of the first three. Of the first three galaxies. Yeah. Well, for, uh, oh, because we are interested only in the main book of the star formation history. So I mean, second peak? How can you this one. Yeah. Because they are they more extended star formation history here, for sure. But we are only trying to simulate the main book because this is that could be affected by the star for, by the realization. We know that this is not going to be reproduced for any star uh, formation before the epoch of realization. That's clear. Because you see in the column I diagram. Uh, upper main sequence of the of, of blue star. So we are trying to reproduce only the main book if, if this has been affected or not. For sure, in the in the trophy regular, that's it's not. Uh, I mean, it's, it's clear that there has been an effect because it, they are still forming star, but not so clear in the transition galaxy and this very long one. So I'm going to keep this one. And I'm going to finish with presenting the, the, the project we are working now. So this is the ILAP project. So it's consisting uh, 11 and uh, 111 orbits uh, via Skilman to serve the six 
uh, satellites of Andromeda Galaxy. We have uh, this nice picture here, the chromatic diagram, how, uh, how we have obtained a photometry, and this is the distribution of the central field we observe with the APS and the parallel field observed with, with the white field camera 3. And these are the preliminary star formation histories obtained for the, this Andromeda, except for Andromeda 1, we are still working on that, this is the preliminary. And compared with the isolated one is very interesting because I have put here the reinitiation. What we see is that these galaxies, compared with the isolated one, are quenching earlier than the isolated one. Could be, uh, for, for example, could be uh, being affected by uh, the uh, M31 galaxy, of, uh, by heating the, the gas, or the residual gas in this galaxy, or for the reason why it's clear that this galaxy are quenching before that the uh, isolated one. A uh, very interesting result in this galaxy is for Andromeda 2. So this galaxy uh, in 2004 was predicted, uh, was uh, a paper that, that uh, said that this is galaxy is a merger remnant of two distinct rock galaxies. And this is very interesting because when we observe the chromatic diagram, this is a it has two RGB, separate, here separated two RGB, right? And when we model, we obtain the star formation history for this uh, galaxy, what we obtain is, this is the salt the star formation history, the salt color matrix diagram, the solution color matrix diagram. We can reproduce the double RGB, you can see here, you see a vast star evolution library, we, we, uh, uh, we weren't able to do that with all the stellar library, like uh, for example Padova, the artist, only with this, and, but only using the uh, the, the turn off, the main sequence and the and the sub membrane. Only using this, we are able to reproduce the double RGB, and the double RGB came from two distinct separate events, star formation events. An old one, more metaphor, the main one, and a second peak with a uh, uh, more metal region and, um, and nothing in the middle, a, a stop in the middle, so this is, is clearly uh, uh, is the, the consequence, has, as a consequence, this separation and the split in the RGB. Another project we are involved in is a bigger project, the early stellar population in Galaxy, so I'll be saying it to obtain star formation of all satellite on the Milky Way within 250 kiloparsecs. So these are students working in some of these galaxies, some of them with uh, INT, Rika Fusco with Subaru, uh, with the uh, division of uh, Professor Roberto Lupo and Anno, um, and uh, Margarita Bettine using Blackman and Subaru telescope with collaboration and Cassisi. We have uh, now some the first column to diagram for the first column to diagram. This is for the ultra faint rock. So the intention I is to, to, to analyze the role of the uh, Milky Way satellites in the formation of the, of the galaxy. So these are the, these are HST data with uh, white field camera IPS and white field camera 3, infrared, Orusa Major, Cameron Tishi, all of these are also fine. Look at how narrow are the RGB, probably are uh, showing us a very sim single stellar event. Also, we have data with Subaru and Blanc Total Decan Telescope for Sculptor, Sextant, and for Sextant we have three filters, so we have two chromatic diagrams, so we can have combination with filters to obtain star formation history and see what can we do with three filters at the same time. And finally, a very big project we are involved now, which is the Vista Variable Survey in the Piala. This is a uh, data taken in Chile with four points one meter uh, uh, Vista telescope with a uh, good -time camera. It's a public infrared uh, variable survey of the Milky Way. I think they observed 1,000 million of point source in an area with huge area, 420 square degrees. Uh, it's a, the, the realize is a big infrared outlet in five fast band. We have a catalog of 1 million of variable stars. And we can use that, these two, uh, to do this type of science, characterize the variables, bulge, star, cluster, center, 
search for microlensing, star cluster, new star cluster, different ages, and study the structure of the inner galactic bulge and the adjacent midplane to cast light on how the Milky Way formed. This is the image of the of the tiles observed. So the bulge is nearly complete, complete, 90 percent in our three filters, and this is 100 percent complete. Uh, of uh, 152 tiles observed. And this is the core mapping diagram. So we have a, a student involved in uh, an IEC involved in this work. Um, our intention is to obtain the star formation history of the Milky Way Bulge in collaboration with Ella Valenti of ESO and to obtain the star formation history and the spatial distribution of the star population of the adjacent disk to the Bulge uh, in collaboration with Sandy Cassisi here at Terra. Uh, finally, the summary. So I presented a PSA of Mia, a star formation for multi population safety fitting to recall the age and the of distribution of the star city using a color matrix diagram with no constraint in age and metallicity relation. It's a non parent recall. And we showed that the doctor who is an excellent laboratory to study the formation and evolution of the galaxy. Because we can obtain stuff really labeled star formation history for homogeneously, uh, and they and this may cast light on process involving galaxy formation and evolution like reionization, hierarchical scenario versus monolithic collapse, morphology of the galaxy, and uh, mass metal generation. And that's it. Thank you.